Welcome. Thank you very much for coming this evening. My name is Paula Maxwell. I'm one of the assistant principals here at BR. Uh, before we get started this evening, I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping items. Um, if you could kindly put your cell phones on um, silence, that would be helpful. We do have bathrooms. If you go out uh, the exits in the rear and hug the wall to the right, they're just outside the gym. Feel free to um, use the restrooms at any point. And finally, we have exits to my left, right, and rear, should we have um, an evacuation. So again, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy days to come here and participate in this very important conversation around addiction. You know, just chatting out in the foyer earlier with um, DA Cruz and Dr. Mews about this epidemic and, and what the governor has done and what his charge is. And I don't think there's anyone in this room that doesn't know somebody that has been touched by the opioid and or addiction epidemic here in the Commonwealth. So by having you here, um, really demonstrates to us the good work we're trying to do and the importance of it. So thank you for being here this evening. So just a little bit about how this sort of developed into tonight. Um, I'd like to recognize Angela Watson, the principal of BR, and Mr. Warnock, one of the assistant principals. We were chatting over the summer and we thought, you know, what are we doing here at BR? What can we do as a community? So we put our heads together and we wrote a grant through BSU. They have a, a community outreach program for the Bridgewater and Raynham uh, School District. And so we partnered with them and they were very gracious and generous to um, support our grant, which has allowed us to sponsor an Opioid Awareness Month here during the month of March. And so this evening's event kicks off a month long of educational programs for our students, parents, and community members um, within the Bridgewater and Raynham uh, District. So I'd like to thank Sue McComb and her committee. I see Evelyn DeLutis out there. You're just a, a fixture in the community and, and all that you do. Thank you very much. Uh, Lorraine Cardoza, again, thank you. Um, without your help, I don't think we would um, be able to provide what we need this month for our students and community. I also want to recognize the local coalition. Uh, Bridgewater and Raynham is now part of a local coalition, which is part of a regional coalition. It is um, a five-year grant that is sponsored by, and forgive me if I mess this up, BSAS, it's the Bureau of Substance Abuse Services. And so basically what that is, is um, a, a state-governed organization um, that works with communities, Bridgewater being one of them, and Drainham, and developing um, needs assessments and determining what we as a community need to um, do to curb underage drinking in particular, which um, in fact will decrease um, people from moving on to opiates. Um, the members of that committee, which is called Bridging Lives, we have several here in, in the audience. If you could just stand up to be recognized because your work has been incredibly valuable. Those of you part of Bridging Lives, um, thank you. It's a new organization. It's made up of uh, members from the Bridgewater, um, Fire and Police Department, uh, Bridgewater University Campus Police, BSU, uh, Dr. Kern, Dr. Kern, I saw you walk in, thank you very much for what you contribute to the community, as well as the Council on Aging, Lorraine, thank you, and BRRSD. I'd like to recognize Superintendent Swenson, Thank you for your support and um, making this endeavor possible as well. And members of the school committee, and that goes without saying. So lots and lots of people coming together to do some good work. Um, this evening, that, that is um, certainly the focus. And at this point, um, I would like to introduce Representative D'Amelia. He has been very gracious to join us this evening. And again, your work that you've done with the governor 
and what you've brought to these communities has been tremendous, and we appreciate all that you've done for us. And Rep. D'Amelia is going to um, introduce one of our keynote speakers. I hope you enjoy this evening. Thank you very much. Uh, this is such an important issue that we have to deal with. Uh, I want you to look up here and see what that says. No town is immune. I can tell you firsthand, our community is not immune. Bridgewater and Rainham, it's, it's here. You know, some people think this is an inner city, inner city problem. It's in Lawrence, Lowell, and Houghton, and Brockton. It's not. It's everywhere. So I am extremely thankful to see the people that have turned out this evening. I'm extremely thankful to the people that are going to speak after me that have a tremendous amount of knowledge about this issue and to put it on the forefront. I, I, we passed some legislation in the House and in the Senate right now. It's, it's in conference committee, but it's going to take more than what we can do. I, I'm more than willing to do my part. You know, I've, I've met with the governor a number of times. I mean, he's taken this issue head on. This is of the utmost importance to him and, and myself and my colleagues. But it's going to take our communities, our, our government, our families, our friends to, to uh, spread the word because it, it is all around us and it's a scourge that we have to, 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 to grab by the horns of the feet. So, uh, there are, there are a lot of things that are going on. The legislation is going to speak to limiting uh, the amount of days that our care providers can issue scripts. It speaks to what we can do you know, with education. There's about 42 sections in the, in the education piece alone. There are a lot of things. I wasn't asked to speak specifically about what was going on. I was asked to introduce our wonderful district attorney, district attorney, uh, Timothy Cruz. We're so fortunate to have him. I've learned a tremendous amount uh, with him and uh, you know, him and, and, and Sheriff McDonald and, and many others. But uh, I'm encouraged to see the number of people that, that are here tonight. Thank you for coming. And let's pull together and do what we need to do to take this problem head on. Thank you. Uh, District Attorney Cruz. Thanks, uh, uh, Angelo. I appreciate that. Uh, and um, I, I appreciate the efforts of everybody here tonight uh, for what they do uh, on a daily basis. I want to thank Superintendent Swenson, Principal Watson, and Assistant Principal Maxwell, and obviously Representative Amelia for uh, doing the work that they do every day. When we have issues, uh, with the public safety concerns, I know that with Representative Amelia, I can turn to him and get the help that I need uh, up from Beacon Hill from the many challenges that we, sit, that we face in public safety. Um, you know, many times uh, when people think of the district attorney's office, they don't think of the preventative things that we do. They think of the television shows, they think of Law and Order, they think of CSI, Crime Conviction in 60 Minutes uh, with commercials. They don't think and they don't know about the many things that we do in our communities trying to prevent crime, trying to get in front of crime, trying to get in front of the issues that are out there. Um, and going to schools and talking to schools and to kids and to parents regarding the challenges, the challenges that they face. And the challenges that they face are incredible. Our kids face challenges now that we never did when we were growing up. And we need to make sure that we as parents are working with our kids and let them understand that, yes, you are our children, but we are your parents. And uh, we'll be, like I always tell, used to tell my kids when they were small, I'll be your friend when you're 25. But when you are 12 and 13, I am your parent. And I'm going to tell you the things that you need to hear. Because we're dealing with a, a, a crisis that we haven't seen before in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The opioid crisis that we have, the epidemic that we deal with, affects all of our communities and affects numerous public safety issues. And as that, the thing is, no town is immune. It doesn't matter what the zip code is. It doesn't matter how much money you make. It doesn't matter where you live. 
What I see across our county, here in Plymouth County, which consists of 27 communities, the city of Brockton, and 26 towns. What I see is a, a, a great uh, rural, suburban, and urban area. And it happens in every town of our county. And we see all too often the biggest problem that we face. The too many people in our community are dying from this drug, from this disease, from this addiction that's going on right now. And we also see that the prevalence of op opioids creates other issues and other problems. It leads to criminal activities such as breaking and enemies, robberies, drug trafficking. <coughs> And it deals with kids who are using the drugs who have become disengaged with their education and pulls them away from the path that you fight so hard every day to try to make sure that your kids stay on. The path of education, the path of bettering themselves, making sure that our kids are better than we are. And every day we have kids, unfortunately, who are popping oxys or the, work, the next step after that, shooting up heroin. The ripple effects of this conduct are endless. And I think all you have to do is turn on your television, open up the newspaper, go on your phone, and you will see the problems that we continue to face. And I think that all you hear is the bad news. And there is plenty of it. But there are a lot of good people who are working hard right now, and a lot of them that are in this room tonight that have faith that recognize this issue and are facing and dealing with it and how do we get in front of it? Last year, myself and our Sheriff Joe McDonald created the Plymouth County Drug Task Force. What we're trying to do is pull in professionals from all areas of our community, healthcare, law enforcement, education, government, parents, faith-based, research, because we need to get that information and pull it together to be that one voice, that one stop shopping. To understand that we all have to work together and we all have to work collaboratively to make sure that we can eradicate this problem. I was never good with these. There we go. There is no doubt that the opiate problem is bigger than Plymouth County. Federal, state, and local agencies agree that the issue is not isolated to just here in Massachusetts. Prescription drug abuse is the fastest growing drug problem. According to the National Institute of Drug Abuse, in 2015, prescription and over-the-counter drugs were the most commonly abused substances after alcohol and marijuana by those 14 years of age or older. <coughs> we need to end the notion that because a doctor prescribes it, that it's a safe substance to take and to finish the bottle. Parents need to make sure that we know what we're talking about from prescription drug abuse, just as much as we talk to our kids about alcohol, about drugs on the street, about synthetic marijuana, whatever may be coming down the pipeline. They, we, our kids must understand that because you get a prescription from a doctor, there are ways to be safe with that. In a few moments, uh, we're lucky enough to have Dr. Dan Muse with us tonight. And he's going to talk about one part of this problem, uh, as I'm sure that a lot of us know, students are getting injured. They play in sports. They get hurt. And they get prescribed painkillers after a surgery. And quickly, many of them become addicted because they are unsure how to take it. But make sure that you understand this extends beyond student-athletes. If your child has their wisdom teeth pulled, they may walk out with a prescription for a full bottle of Percocets. Both parents and teens need to know that these should be taken as needed. And as Dr. Muse has told us many times, a youth need only take about 10 pills before they start feeling addictive cravings. We face another challenge here in Massachusetts that's coming up this November. It is the legalization attempt of marijuana. And I know that many people think marijuana is harmless. And I am not a medical doctor, but I've talked to a lot of them. 
And I understand from talking to them that marijuana, especially today's marijuana, is a gateway drug that is being packaged and shot to our kids. And make no mistake about it, that what this target is, is on our kids. Recently I went to Colorado. I went with many district attorneys here from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and I went to one of the legalized marijuana shops. And when you walk in there, because it's an all-cash business, because it's still a federal offense, when you walk in there, you can basically pick what kind or what level of marijuana you want, the level of THC that's going to be in there. It's almost like going to the gas station. Low test, medium test, high test. You pay per the grant. But the thing that was really striking to me was the way that they were targeting our kids, targeting their kids. Edibles, brownies, cookies, uh, soda, chocolate milk, gummy beers, Swedish fish, the candy that was all about, it looks just like regular food and regular candy. Myself and other DA spoke to the district attorney out in Denver and talked about the challenges that he faced. And he says that basically Denver is the Amsterdam of the United States. When you walk down Main Street in Colorado, in Denver, you see kids standing on the corner, holding up their signs, need money for, uh, need money for marijuana. It was really um, something that got your attention. We're legal. Kids are more likely to use it. The marijuana that they're selling now is seven times more potent than it was back in the, in the 60s and 70s. And as I often, my, my, many of the DAs will say, it's not your grandparents' marijuana anymore. It is laced with things that are dangerous, that are hurting kids, that are leading them to the next step. Marijuana-related emergency room visits has increased by 30% in Colorado since the legalization, as has their traffic deaths. And why? The financial backers behind it are not local leaders. They're not local medical people. They're not grassroots activists. They are big business. And they are going to make money off our kids. Make no mistake about it. Let's listen to our doctors, our counselors, our substance abuse specialists here in the greatest medical class community in the world. Let's listen to them. Let's make sure that people understand that the decades of research that marijuana is harmless has been debunked. And let's make sure that right now, when we are sitting in the middle of this opiate crisis, the last thing we need and the last thing our kids need is the legalization of marijuana. It is a challenge that we need to face. As you can see, the most recent data shows that opioids, the ones that read, are by far the leading cause of drug overdose deaths in the United States since 1999. In 2012, the Massachusetts Report on the Preventable Determinants of Health reported that Eastern Massachusetts, which includes our county, has the highest rate of ER visits for heroin. This ranks ahead on a per capita basis ranks ahead of major metropolitan regions such as New York City, Chicago, and Detroit. You start out by taking opiates prescribed to them, and once your prescription ends, the addiction becomes very expensive. And that's how you see kids progress from opiate pills, from prescription medication, to the next step. It used to be that on the street, a, an 80 milligram tablet of, of Oxy goes for a dollar a milligram. 80 bucks, even though probably if it was purchased uh, through a prescription, it probably cost four dollars. So the markup is incredible. A lot of the, the pharmaceutical companies now have gotten rid of the 80 milligrams, and the biggest street pill right now is a Perc 30, 30 milligrams of Percocet, and that's what you see. And that's going on the street now for anywhere between 30 and 40 dollars. But the problem is, is that kids' body chemistry will change and they will continue to crave the next step and they can't afford it. And that's how you see a lot of kids get into trouble. That's how they break into their parents' uh, jewelry box. They steal from everybody because they need that drug. And eventually they can't afford it. So they go the next step. So the kids who never would have thought of smoking heroin or getting near heroin and certainly not shooting up heroin, they are. Because it's cheap. It's an opiate. 
When I was a young prosecutor more than 30 years ago, we were dealing with an opiate problem back then, and the purity of heroin on the street back then was anywhere between 15, 18, 20 percent. Because back then, a lot of the dealers, were, what the phrase was, they were stepping on it. They were taking inositol, they were taking vitamin B substitutes. They were making more from less so they could sell it and make more money from less product. The purity of the heroin on the street now is 90, 90, 90 95% pure. And that's if it's not laced with something. The next problem would be with fentanyl, which is out there now. We didn't have a fentanyl case in Plymouth County until a year ago. Never had one. And now it's everywhere. Fortunately, there has been a law that has been passed recently, which now allows us to prosecute people who are pushing fentanyl. Prior to that, it didn't fit any of our categories of our crimes. So we're dealing now with a stronger uh, heroin that's out there. And you can get it sometimes as cheap as $3 a bag. Think of that. $3 a bag. It's like a large coffee. It's incredibly dangerous, it's incredibly cheap. And it's something that we need to have to make sure that we can do our job as prosecutors, making sure that we're going after individuals who are selling this poison on the streets. Because the real people that are selling it, they're not using it, they're selling it. They're there to make money, they make it in volume. And they turn around and they, and they, and they move it. Like I said, in terms of Massachusetts, we, Plymouth County is not immune to the issue. According to the Executive Office of Health and Human Services, in 2014, nine towns in Plymouth County ranked in the top 25% of Massachusetts confirmed unintentional opiate overdose deaths. For those of you that may not know, in my office, in the district attorney's office, where I have roughly 60 some odd lawyer, lawyers that work for me, and probably another six years so administrative, victim witness advocates, people that work on a daily basis with the 20,000 criminal cases we have in Plymouth County every year. We also have with us, assigned to us, state police. State police, they call them the CPAC unit, the Crime Prevention and Control Unit that is assigned to the DA's office who work for me. And they work for half of them, every unattended death, every death that occurs, not in a hospital setting, not in a nursing home, not that is attended by, by a physician. The state police who work for myself, will go, will be called by the local police, to go to that scene to make sure that nothing suspicious happens. And that's part of their job. So we keep track of the individuals of these, of these non-suspicious deaths and how many cases do we have. And what we have seen, and it's important I think to note also that in 2008 Massachusetts decriminalized possession of less than an ounce of marijuana. Every year but one, and that year I believe was 09, every year but one since then, our fatal opiate overdoses have increased countywide. In 2013, we had 47 fatal, 47 fatal overdoses in Plymouth County. 2013. 2014, 75. 2015, 142. As I stand in front of you tonight, we have 22 in Plymouth County right now this year, 2016. So we're on pace, our numbers, for the same uh, portion that we had last year. <clears throat> what you're going to find out, I think, a little bit what Dr. Muse will talk about when he gets up here, this doesn't count the people that actually pass in the hospital. If, if our, our first responders, our firefighters, who I'm so glad to see so many of here, who are out there using Narcan who are saving a lot of people's lives, if they revive somebody, if they get them to the hospital, there's still a, a difficult chance that they may pass at the hospital. My numbers don't count the hospital numbers. And you're going to hear the numbers of overdoses that we have from just Signature Healthcare Brockton Hospital alone. It is staggering on a monthly basis how busy the ER is for the people that are brought there that are overdosing from these drugs. It is staggering. And it is something that we must get in front of. So what are we doing about it? What can we do to make sure that we can at least start to try to bring in people together? And there's been different levels of this. And the governor's uh, obviously put together his statewide task force. And we've had a number of people from our region that were on that task force. 
But what efforts are we doing in our county to try to combat this issue? So last year, myself and the sheriff uh, have put together our drug abuse task force, which is a means of combining our resources to enhance the, the capacity of our county as a whole to tackle this problem. So what do we do? The task force currently is working on a number of strategies. The first one is building the capacity of our task force by adding key experts that live and work in our county. So we've been able to reach out, as I said earlier, bringing different people from different areas to try to get the best practices, to try to become a clearinghouse for the other uh, groups we have in our county. I think on any given day you'll find out that there are a lot of people who, just like yourself, are very concerned about this problem and are trying to work together with other parents as to what they can do. So doesn't it make sense for all of us to eventually have that one clearinghouse so that we can work together and work in conjunction? So we bring in Signature Healthcare from Brockton, so that we're dealing with Bridgewater State University, Learn to Cope, High Point Treatment Center, law enforcement partners, our legislators are some of the key ones. This year, our uh, Drug Abuse Task Force will be hosting our annual conference on May 17th. It's going to be at Bridgewater State University. And the theme this year is going to be the role of educators in the opiate crisis. So we're trying to get best practices to get in front. We need to reduce the demand for opiate use. Already there exist many resources like documentation presentation that the task force will be working on to bring to each community to help the youth and the parents to understand the dangers of opiate abuse. Reducing the supply and accessibility of opiates. Just recently, we received uh, state funding to add as a further assistant district attorney in my office to prosecute the Class A cases. Class A are the opiates, the heroin, the prescription meds. To go after the individuals and make sure that they understand that although half of my troopers while working on our, on our homicides and our unattended deaths, the other half are working on drug cases. And that the dealers that are out there that are making money off this drug and or other individuals who may be prescribing drugs have to understand that they will be held accountable. They will be held accountable for their actions. And that will send a message, I believe, if we can continue to do that. We are dealing with issues Right now, we, we're living in, the, in a world where people are trying to take away uh, some of the minimum mandatory uh, drug sentences for dealers, which would be an incredible, incredibly bad mistake. Allow the prosecutors to do their job and go after the people who are peddling the poison. Allow us to send a message to our community that we will not tolerate. We can help people who have drug problems. We have drug courts in three out of the four district courts in our county. We can provide services. We can help individuals after their cases. We can make sure that they're access to beds because we need to have more beds in our county and in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that we don't have. But the dealers have to understand that if you choose to do that, there will be a price to pay. Incorporating and augmenting their innovative treatment options that exist in the county. Here in our county, we are fortunate to have one of only five recovery high schools, Independence Academy in Brockton. Independence Academy provides local youth in recovery an opportunity to still pursue a high school diploma while being able to access treatment and counseling. What can you do? Like I said at the outset, Let's talk to our kids about the danger of prescription drugs. To many kids and even adults, they think because it comes from a doctor that makes it safe. If there are opiates in your home, keep them secure. Especially, this is true if there's a grandparent or an elderly person who lives in the house. Kids are known to take the opiate pills and they'll put it and replace it with Tylenol, put other uh, pills in there. My office, uh, in the last few years, has put in prescription medication uh, destruction boxes in every police department here in Plymouth County and will soon be in every college. It's going to be at the Bridgewater State Campus Police, it will be at the Stone Hill Police, Massasoit. And what this is, is for a place, it's an avenue that if you have unused, unwanted, unnecessary, unneeded prescription medication, don't flush it. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem for the environment. Bring it to the police department. They will keep track of it. They will eventually take it to Cabanta down in Rochester, down in Middleborough, and it will be destroyed. We will keep track of those pills. 
We will also make sure that Covent can use the, the destruction of those drugs for the purposes of producing energy. We have had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds of these prescription medications go down there over the course of the last couple of years. It is incredibly important that we do that. So make sure if you know somebody, especially if we all have uh, you, you know, a loved one who perhaps is on medication at their home and they get more medication, they stick it in the medicine chest and they may forget about it. Go through them. If you don't need them, get rid of them. And get rid of them safely and get rid of them so that our kids aren't going to be uh, challenged or they're not going to be uh, thinking they're in a position where they can grab them. Because like I said, it can happen. And it can happen to anybody. And I, I think at the outset, as was said, um, I think we all know someone who has either themselves or a family member is stuck with this problem. So therefore, in my opinion, it is our responsibility to try to work with them to get them the help that they need, to work with our government to get the beds that we need, to make sure that we get dealers off the street, and to make sure that we continue to work together to get the best practices to help and to save as many lives as possible. There are a lot of good people out there working hard on this. And a lot of them are right here in this room today. And many times, when you go out and you do a good thing, uh, people may not thank you. Let me say thank you to you, all you people who are out here tonight, who every day understand the challenges that you face and understand the problems that we have to deal with. And when it all comes back at the end of the day, to make sure that we as parents talk to our kids and let them understand that doctors need to be held accountable also, and they will. And that we need to ask questions of our doctors when they prescribe to our son or, our, or their daughter or our daughter when they have um, the, their teeth taken or wisdom teeth taken out. Why so many medications? Why so many pills? Why do we need to have those? A doctor doesn't hand out insulin to a diabetic and say, good luck. They shouldn't be doing that with opiates. They should be making sure that they tell you what to do with it. They prescribe the right amount. When Governor Baker's legislation goes through, I'm hopeful that's going to numb, uh, minimize the amount of drugs that are out there. And if, if ask your doctor, how many times do they take it? Do they need to take it? And if they don't need to take it, how do I get rid of it? Ask the questions. I want to stress, once again, that no town is immune from what, what we've been talking about tonight. There are plenty of kids, good kids from good families, kids that play sports, kids that were on the honor roll, student council members, and they still get wrapped up in this. These pills are dangerous, and there is a direct line to heroin use. We must continue to work hard and educate the public to keep these, these drugs out of our public's hands. But we need your help as parents, as members of our community, to make sure that our kids understand that. So for all of your efforts, I thank you, uh, and I thank you for coming out here tonight. Thank you. I'd like to introduce now Dr. Dan Muse. Uh, Dr. Muse is a physician in the Signature Healthcare uh, Emergency Department and also Sports Smart Program Director. He's coached youth in high school hockey for more than 10 years, founded Canton Youth Lacrosse, Style Lacrosse at Canton High, coaches lacrosse at the youth and high school level. Uh, but really, what he does, in my opinion, he is somebody who goes out and gives his own time because he understands the problems that we're facing. And he understands that the way that we're going to get in front of this is by meetings like this and groups such as this, and by working together to get the best ideas, get the best practices, and let people understand that even though we face a problem, it is not insurmountable, and eventually, we will be in front of it. Thank you. Just give me one second.
I'm a walker. I was one of 11, you always had to run before my mother caught us and beat the snot out of us. And yes, she was right. What you're gonna hear right now is that I could be my cousin, my cousin Vinny, when he went up to the opening argument to paraphrase him, not exactly what he said was, whatever he said is right, thank you. Because in reality, I'm gonna repeat a lot of what he said. And that actually is because what is going on is a major intertwining of the law and medical issues. And we're talking about substance abuse, which has reached epidemic proportions in this country. Make no mistake about it, it is in every community. And before we really get to the bulk or the meat of what we're concerned about, certainly at a high school, the student athlete, don't forget, remember, there are a lot of drugs out there. And it's not just narcotics, which you can see over here, the list is endless. And that's only part of the list of the different types of narcotics that are produced. You also have bath salts, which can be bought at, at you know, a 7 Eleven. They're sold all over the place. Gasoline station. You look at it, you see it in your daughter's room. <laughs> what a little princess. No, she's throwing him in a pipe and smoking him. Okay, these are amphetamine type drugs. Sold over the counter. Why? Because the FDA can't keep up with them. You can't make something illegal until you know what it is. Then of course, at the NA, ecstasy, keep an eye on those pills. That isn't what you want to see when you walk into your kid's room. Little signs, you know, for you, kiss on the pill. But these are the different names for those. My favorite is Skittles. And then, synthetic marijuana. Now, we're seeing a heck of a lot of that. And again, purchased over the counters, not for human ingestion. Across all of these, that's what they say. Oh, we're not selling it. This is just an incense. They'll come in raging, out of their mind, leaning forward, picking fights, screaming and hollering, and all I can think to myself, this doesn't look like Bob Marley. So I'm not quite sure where it came with the marijuana, because I don't know what they're putting in it. I suspect pesticides and anything else they could find in the garage, but it is definitely not marijuana. And one of the greatest scourges in this country, which fortunately has not hit us, meth and crystal meth, Hillbilly heroin, as they refer to it. Why? Because it's more in the air, rural areas. Rest assured, this is not only a major health issue, it's a hazmat issue. When they make this stuff, things blow up. And this is what it happens to you. If you want to go to a very scary site as a parent, go to Faces of Meth and Fenty. 22 years old, 33 years old. 34, 40, over and over and over again. This drug destroys the brain and destroys the body. Now, who exactly is using? Well, everybody. This is a breakdown by race of who's using uh, illegal substances. And by age, and you can see right here, 20, 24 years old, look down here, this age group. Bottom line is this, kid is not turning 25, 30 years old and using. They're pit starting early. Yeah, they do, but typically it's not just out of you know the desire to see what happens. They're not risk takers at that age anymore. It's in the high schools. It's right after high school and college. This is when they're getting hooked. And while there are a lot of different ways that this happens, my concern as a physician is what physicians are doing about it and how we are playing a role in that. And if you take the heroin and the opioid, tag those up, it puts us above the marijuana in terms of narcotic use. So what does all this mean? You just saw what we're looking at. Well, we're losing the battle. We're losing it big time. Okay, too many kids are dying. Too many people are dying in all the communities. Eighty percent of all narcotics prescribed in the world are prescribed in the United States. Last time I looked, we ain't the size of China. All right? So what does that mean? What does that say? Either we are the biggest wimps in the world or we're overprescribed. And this gives you a number. You're gonna find a trend here. Females are always under the males. And then honestly, when I ask him, he asks, you know, especially when women come in who are 
uh, using narcotics with overdoses and how do you get hooked? And predominantly, they will say, my boyfriend. However, with Title IX, we do have female athletes, fortunately, because they should be playing sports. Females get hurt too, and unfortunately, I also hear more and more of that, that they got hurt because of the sports injury, and then they got addicted to the medications. And the same thing holds here, cocaine, and you can see a trend here, everything is going up. Prescription drugs, which are all types of prescription drugs, opioid pain relievers, and heroin. And that's taken a major increase. And now in Brockton, because we talked about this, what's happening at our home front? Great, that was the national statistics. What does that mean to me? Well, here, this is your backyard. And rest of remind, let me remind you also of the use of, that, of prescription drugs or substance abuse by race. Okay, white, 56%. Now, Brockton is a minority city, so there's a disparity here. What does that mean? Well, it means that they, at Brockton Hospital in 2015, 615 people came in who had overdosed on narcotics. 481 of them received Narcan. Okay? 421 were males. 194 females. They did not all live in Brockton. Over 50% were purchasing in Brockton. They were coming out of rehabs from Brockton. But they were not living in the city of Brockton. And tragically, even with all this Narcan that's out there that they received, 24 still died. These do not go in District Attorney's Cruz's census. He doesn't know about these. So you can add another 24 to your list. That's, and by the way, that is just Brockton Hospital. That's not Taunton, which you could have gone to from here, or Good Samaritan Hospital. Just Brockton Hospital alone. So now, how did this actually come about? Because it just, we didn't wake up one day and all of a sudden have this problem. And there's a lot of factors, and everybody has to share the blame in this. Everybody. Pharmaceuticals, the government, healthcare providers, hospital administrators and insurance companies, and even the patients, who most hospital administrators prefer to call consumers. And this is what you're looking at. And this is how complex it is. So we have the pharmaceuticals over here someplace, drug, drug companies up here, who came back in, in the 80s and 90s and said, hey, narcotics are safe. You can use them in acute pain. Don't worry about it. And they're going to feel a lot better with them. They're a lot better than that Motrin and Tylenol and stuff. And they went to the government and said, you know those prescriptions you make us, you, the doctors use, the triplicates that take forever to get? Well, you should get rid of them. That way they can prescribe what the patient needs. So the government said, okay, we'll get rid of them. Now it's free season. So they come back and they convince them that pain has to be addressed. And let's have a pain score. Call it the fifth vital. So you have four objective findings, blood pressure, heart rate, temperature, etc. And then this objective finding, you know, what's your pain on a scale of one to 10? So then we throw in that you have the drug companies doing this to the government, the government comes over here and tells the hospital administrators, and the insurance companies, we're changing things, and if the, these doctors don't meet their matrix, we're not going to pay you. So if you don't get the patients in see them quickly, if you don't give them what they need quickly, if you don't give them the antibiotics for the pneumonia on time, we're not going to pay you as much. If you don't fill out these scores, we're not going to pay you. And by the way, they better address the pain because we're sending them surveys which if they don't address the pain and give them what they need, then we're not going to pay the doctors and we're not going to pay the hospital. So now they come back to the doctors and they tell the doctor this whole same issue. And at the same time, while this was all going, we bought this bill of goods. We're there thinking, okay, everybody has to have a zero pain score. Because if they have any pain at all, we're not doing our job. So we're going to provide all these medications, but wait a minute, there's more to it. These people over here, the patient, gets to survey me and grade me on how I give the pain. And if I don't treat them appropriately and give them enough pain medications, 
they're going to give me a bad score, and the hospital's going to tell me about doing my job, and they're going to take my money away. And then the patients themselves decide, hey, this is great. I want it, and I want it my way, the McDonald's syndrome. Give it to me the way I want it. No lettuce, no tomatoes, and extra cheese. Okay, and I'll take the uh, tens instead of fives of those Percocets. So all of a sudden you have this whole system that's fallen over each other in an effort to treat pain when in fact all we're doing in many cases is creating addicts. So now what are we going to do? Well, we can't let this continue. 24 people died last year who came to Brockton Hospital. Not the ones who didn't even make it. 24 people died of the 400, 600 and some odd that actually came in just one small community hospital. Okay, and we have to fight back on this. So the bottom line is your kid gets addicted or you're suspicious of it and it's out there. You gotta do something about it, okay? And if you think that your child might have a substance abuse problem, I am gonna tell you right now, you are in the fight for your life. Because every time you go to sleep knowing that, you're going to wonder if your kid's going to wake up. Every time they go to the bathroom, you're going to wonder what they're doing. Every time they go out, are they shooting up? This will become your life. It will overwhelm you. And at the same time, you don't want to believe it. No one believe, wants to believe that their kid did anything wrong. Well, you better, and it could be something else, but you better be darn well sure that if you think this is just him or her being a teenager, you're right. Otherwise, you're going to lose them. So the bottom line comes down to this, and it happens over the time. And I have to tell you, many a parent has saved by you know what, because they have come in and they've said to me, especially with their kid, something's wrong, I don't know what's up. And I'm looking at the little kid, and I'm thinking, this kid looks great. Well, guess who was right? Me, who basically doesn't know the kid, or the mother who delivered this child, who has nurtured this child, who knows everything about that kid. The mothers went out every time. Fathers, by the way, worthless. <laughs> you just sort of sit there, yeah, like, yeah, why don't you try? Yeah, yeah right, whatever you say, Doc. <laughs> if we didn't have mothers, we, most of us would be dead. <laughs> but make sure that it is something else. Make sure you're definitely right. And the bottom line is if you think something is wrong, you're probably right. And so what are you going to be looking at? What's going to happen? You have this one kid who's energetic, outgoing, doing, you know, wants to be involved in everything, all of a sudden getting really laid by with the behavior, edgy, tired, you know, the sleep patterns change. They just don't seem to really have the motivation anymore. They become very disinterested in the things that they really liked before. And then what else happens? How about new friends? Grades are slipping. They're becoming secretive. Starting to miss things. They're sort of lying, they're lying to you, they're saying they're here or there when they're not. All of these are signs that somebody has a drug problem. So what about those new friends? Well, find out who the new friends are. Okay. You gotta face up to it. And if all of a sudden your kid has been hanging out with the same kid since they were in third grade and they disappear, and you see new people showing up, you got a problem. Just doesn't work that way. And check with the old friends. Honestly, they're afraid. Most kids want to come forward. They're afraid. They don't want to wrap the kid up. So if you come and say, what's up? How come you're not hanging out with them anymore? Chances are they will let you know. And talk to the parents, teachers. They're going to see what's happening and find out what they're saying. In grades, very few people have the capacity to do really well in school and be addicted to things. It just doesn't go hand in hand. You know, they're becoming very secretive. This is one of the telltale signs. Something is wrong. Now, does that mean it's drugs? No. But typically, when kids have problems, they become extremely secretive, and certainly they do with drugs. And they'll be spending, especially with drugs, more time in their room. Why? They use it. It's their safe haven. You know, a kid, teenage room is like a dog crate. That's where they feel safest. Sometimes, if you walk in, it looks like a dog crate. <laughs> they're not going to be wanting to tell you what, where they're going or what they're doing or who they're seeing. Why? Because it's a whole new group of people and they're using. 
And with it, you're going to be catching the lies because they have to cover up. Their life has changed. They've fallen out of their routine. You know them for their routine. This routine has changed. So guess what? They're going to be lying to you. And stealing becomes rampant. Jeez, I thought I had a $20 bill in my bureau. Gone. But where, where's my ring? Where, where's my necklace? Gone. And you keep looking for it. What happened to the Xbox? Yeah, I, I guess that's for little kids. I sold it. Drugs are not free. This is an industry. This is a business. They are not going to just say, hey, oh, you need some heroin? Sure, maybe next week. It's fine. No. They are in the business to make money. And they do it very well. And at the end of the day, they are not free. And teenage kids don't have a lot of free disposable income. So guess what? They're going to use yours. And chances are you don't have a lot of disposable income either. The way life is these days. So what are you going to do? You've got to investigate. You have to check. Trust your instincts. The first thing I tell parents to do, go creeping. People, kids put stupid things up on the internet. Instagram, you know, Facebook, all that other stuff. You'd be amazed what you can find by creeping around. And check their texts. Who are they texting? Where are they going? Remember, I mean, I am a civil libertarian on one level, but I pay for those phones, I own those phones, and if I want to see what's on them, they're turning over the password. I am not going to Apple and ask them for their help getting to me either. <laughs> so go looking. By and large, the problem is in the room. They're hiding you. But you have to know what you're looking for, what those papers are, that Q-tips are used with, with drugs and heroin. All of a sudden, they want to clean up their ears all the time. Really? So they're going to see changes, and they're hiding it, and they're going to hide it in the rooms. And remember, all pills have an identifier on it. If you buy some Advil and pull it out, even an over-the-counter medication, and you look at it, there is an identifier on it. Every pill produced in this country has to be identified. And you can go to drugs.com, and here you have see what it looks like. You go to drugs.com, or you can just plug in the pill identifier and put the number in, and that pill's going to come up. If you start seeing for you, kiss, little question marks, guess what? Those were not FDA approved. And you got to get help. That's the bottom line. This is not something that you can handle yourself. And I refer to the Irish Catholic parochial approach. You know, how's everything going? Oh, wonderful! Everybody's doing perfectly. You had the door, they're shooting up, the father's drunk, some of the other kids passed out, you know, they're beating up the sister, the sister's beating up the brother. And, but the world is great on the outside, and they try to hide it. Yes, I'm Irish Catholic. Well, the reality comes down to this. It doesn't work that way. You have to get help. It is out there. You have to seek it. And by the way, there's, remember, there's a stigmata to this. It's an embarrassment. Something's wrong. Get over it. Your kid's going to die if you don't do it. And remember, this is not just impacting you. It is impacting the whole family. It's like any other substance abuse in that the whole family is dragged down. Whether it's alcohol, cocaine, methamphetamine, the whole family is impacted. But with this, narcotics, it stretches even further because of the nature of it. It affects the whole community. I, I facetiously say you can play three degrees of separation from an overdose. And unfortunately, it is true. We all, on some level, know somebody who has a drug problem or who has died from an overdose. And by the way, it happens in every community, in every walk of life. Now, there's help out there, but as I said, you have to ask for it. You have to know your resources and you have to go to it. So now, what we really, what I take personally, I've coached for years. In fact, my, three of my kids have played college sports. My son is a professional hockey coach. I've started lacrosse because I forgot to sign my kid up for the Milton program, so I had to run it and started in Canton for 10 years, talking about tenants. But at the end of the day, if I could do anything, I would have been a phys ed teacher. I didn't know why I didn't stick with that, and I've coached sports. So I really, really have a strong desire to, to attack this problem. Why? Because also I'm a physician. I cannot go out there and stop the cartels. I can't go out on the streets in Brockton and find the sellers and you know, beat them up and throw them in jail. That's his job. <laughs> okay. 
But as a physician dealing with athletes, this is an area, and not just athletes, anyone who seeks our help, this is an area that we have to change and that I hold accountable and personal. And this is an epidemic that we have in this country. And you saw sort of how it started, and this is what we're looking at. These are the pills that have been causing the problems. Schedule two, but mostly the narcotics. And so this is, just a, this is just one small vignette of what I have to deal with, because I actually take the time to ask when they come in, especially the younger ones, how do you get hooked? And the stories are endless, and unfortunately more and more I'm hearing the same story. It has happened from the medical community. And this kid, 24 years old, he overdosed and he asked for a work note. Now, by and large, they usually don't say, hey, doc, before I go, can I have a work note? So, I mean, I, I, did. I, I had to find out, okay, explain what happened. And this was it, he blew out his knee. He was playing soccer, apparently, by his account, a really good soccer player, being looked at colleges, but now he blew it out, had to have surgery. So he got 90 oxycodone. That was for the post-operative care. Got infected, so they gave him another knife. That didn't work, so they had to wash out the knee, and then they got another knife. He said, by now I'm hooked. Doc didn't wake up one morning and decided I wanted to use heroin. And it doesn't happen that way. Now think hard and fast, your kid playing sport. Close your eyes. You don't think this could be your kid, that you couldn't end up going down the same pathway? I assure you, it can happen, and it has happened in this community, and certainly I know in the town I live in Canton, it has happened numerous times. And why? Because narcotics and athletes, they are a deadly combination. It's the perfect storm in the sense that these two forces hit each other, and they just, and essentially, they, they're, they're the perfect combination in terms of causing destruction. Why? Well, let's talk about the athlete first. They're in pain, they got hurt, they need something for the pain. What about the athlete psyche? What do they want to do? They want to get back. They want to play more than anything. And they will put their health aside to play. Okay, and that's the bottom line. When I was growing up, no one, no one would ever think of not playing with a concussion. In fact, some of our best games were played when we had concussions. Didn't remember them, but they scored two touchdowns, you know, three goals. Uh, back then, though, you didn't even film them, so they never got to experience it. But these are the friends. Put me in coach. I can play. I don't care. I don't care if my knee's swollen. It's only a bruise, sprain. I only rung my bell. All oh, this is what the athlete will do. And why? Because they want to be more than just on the sidelines. They want to play. You know, they're risk takers. Winning takes extraordinary acts by ordinary people working together. This is what they do. So they'll extend what they can do and top that off with the fact that, as I showed you before, males more than females have a substance abuse problem. Well, who are the bigger risk takers? Not the females, the males. So it's inherent in them to take risks. And emotionally, they're bonded to the team. They say, no, I am team. Team goals over individual ones. And I assure you, any athlete will tell you they do not remember their teachers' names, but they do remember their coaches and who played in what game and the score of the game and who scored first and second and on and on and on. We remember that, especially guys. My math team had no idea. That guy didn't even like sciences. And the last thing, quite frankly, that they ever want to do is let their team down. Okay. There is absolutely nothing worse for an athlete to be injured and in the locker room, because they know, they were told, I'm still part, you're part of the team, we need you. But they feel like a ghost. They're standing there. They can't help themselves. They want to be more than this. And they know that while everybody's patting them on the back, saying, we really need you, we miss you, at the end of the day, they realize they're indispensable. And that hurts. So now you have narcotics on the other side. What does this do for the athlete? Well, first off, it lets them play through pain. So they allow them to get back there when they're still hurt. And it's more importantly going to provide a euphoria that emotionally makes things more tolerable. When you have the kid who's broken his leg and he can't play, so he's sitting there, guess what he's doing? He's taking him because he's bored and he's getting high on the pill. 
is just blunting his sensorium so we can sort of just get through the boredom and the fact that he's no longer participating. And because of the euphoria, an emotional and psychological attachment to the drug that occurs, and this emotional, this will become a craving that comes on extremely quickly. So when they took the pill, hey, it sort of made me feel good. Well, I think I'll take another one. The doctor gave me 60. I'm supposed to take them all. Or on the third or fourth, they're just saying, I just want it. You know, if I can't play, I might as well just blunt it all out of my system. So I'm going to take these pills. And why, in God's name, would the doctor give me these if they weren't safe? Well, guess what? This is what you end up having. You have a 17-year-old athlete who identifies himself as an athlete. This is their life. They wake up every day, and their, their confidence, their outlook of life is based on their sports and how the team is doing and how they play in that sport. And they're motivated to do well. Why? Because they want to play on that team. You've got to get good grades. If you don't get B's, you don't play. Certainly you have to maintain a good grade. If you're going to be going sink in the woods drinking, don't get caught. Otherwise, you're not playing. Bottom line is they're going to behave because of this. This means more to them than anything. And their whole social life is around the team. These are the people they hang out with. These are their best friends. And now this is all lost because of an injury. They're devastated. So now what happens? What people don't realize, including the family, friends, athlete, is that the athlete's been given a medication that will treat the pain but also provide a euphoria that will allow the player to blunt the personal disappointment into the injury and the emotional turmoil that the injury has caused. Okay, put your head in the body of a 17-year-old. We're adults here. We don't see it that way. But I assure you, this is what they're feeling. Their world is turned upside down. And now you have this medication that essentially is going to let them forget about it. And what happens is that emotional craving that they're taking that sort of blunts it, makes them feel a little better about themselves while they're healing quickly turns into a physical addiction. And that addiction, I assure you, can last a lifetime. And the tragedy is for many, that turns out to be a very, very, very short lifetime. So what are you going to do about it? We've created this problem. And unfortunately, well, first off, fortunately, a lot of doctors have gotten it. And they say, screw it. I'm just not prescribing the medications. I don't care anymore. You want to give me a bad score? Good. At least I didn't kill one of you. So, but we at the same time have created a situation. We have, on the one hand, you have the patient and the parents coming in saying, well, I want the kid's pain, I want the pain treated. And we have a lot of pressures to treat the pain. But on the other hand, you have still a patient's and unfortunately, not well-advised patients. So you're coming along and you're relying on the physician to protect you. And that is my job, to protect you, to do the right thing by you. Like anybody, we're not always right, but it is our job. And we have held them accountable for that. And we also are held in esteem for that. So at the end of the day, there's a conflict here. You want the pain treated, but you want us to protect you. So I give you 60 oxycodone. Well, good. You feel that you're safe. The doctor gave them to me. I can take them. It's okay. Well, in fact, it's not okay. That's too many. And one of the greatest ironies I find is that you see a doctor because you blew out your knee. So they go to physical therapy, tells you to take some Tylenol and Motrin. Physical therapy's not working, so after two or three visits, taking Tylenol and Motrin, how's it feeling? It's sore. All right, well, then we're going to get an MRI. Hey, looks like you're going to have to have surgery. All right, so now they let you walk around with a bad knee for about two, three months, uh, taking physical therapy, taking Tylenol and Motrin, elevating with ice, and now all of a sudden he does the surgery to fix it, so he throws 60, 90 oxycodone at you. Something's inherently wrong with that approach. But that is what we're doing. So now, at some level, we got to educate the consumer, the patient. If you're going to be consumers, and damn it, I want you to be educated consumers. And on that line, don't ever accept 
large amounts of narcotics from a professional healthcare professional. We're around all the time. We have no lives. Jeez, just call us later. We can give you more. But in reality, if they fix the problem, why do you need two, three weeks of the pain medication? Shouldn't be getting better in a few days, and wouldn't it be good practice to only give you a couple of days, then check up on and see how you're doing? And why are we selling these things as, quote, the good stuff? How often have I heard in the past, the nurses or whoever coming in said, oh, the doctor gave you the really good stuff. You just said to the patient, take them all. They were referring that this is strong medications. But in reality, by the way, the drug companies also told you Motrin and Tylenol weren't that good. Guess what? For pain relief, ain't much different than the narcotics. But the narcotics do provide two things that these don't. One, they provide a craving and a euphoria, so you have a good buzz on early on, which turns into an addiction. So we have to have healthcare professionals, we have to have office staff take the time and tell the patients there are other ways of treating pain besides firing yourself with narcotics. And, then, and, the, and the patient and the family member has to say, basically, I want to hear about this. And if you're not going to do it, they're going to rip up the script and you're going to rewrite it. And never accept a prescription, I don't care what it is, until you've had all your questions answered. It's as simple as that. I don't care whether it's insulin, uh, blood pressure medication, and certainly narcotics and other schedule tools. You know how many pills you have, because not all kids become addicted from being hurt. Pill, pill, pill parties go on. Bring whatever pills you have. Any, I presume there are several people here who take pills, and I presume if I took your pills and threw them on the counter and asked you, tell me which one is which, you'd look at them, I don't know, they're all white. But they're all looked at pretty similar. So, what do you do? Well, you, you, know, you go to the grandmother's house, and she got all these oxycodones for her hip surgery. She, of course, didn't take any because they're a much tougher generation than we are. And so there's about two taken out of the 90 that were given, and all the other pills are sitting there. So kid comes along and says, oh, I get the pills for the body. Takes those out, puts the Tylenol in, or the Advil, or whatever. Who's going to know the difference? All they know, it was full before, and it's now still full. And so that is why it's so important that you get rid of the medications as well. And realize at the end that narcotics will cause an emotional addiction first. This is a craving, and this will become a physical addiction. And as I like to say, if all else fails and nothing else seems to work, suck it up. Pain is only hurt, but addiction lasts a lifetime. Any questions? Well, I want to thank you all. <laughs>